All right, so let's get the panel going. So first up, we'll do the, the introductions. We've got uh, William McCausland, who publishes uh, um, Mutant Epoch. Sorry, completely forgot there for a moment, <laughs> which is funny because it's one of my favorite games. Uh, he's also the creative director at uh, Outland Arts and uh, also has a fantasy RPG. Uh, I forget what that one's called. Oh, no, I, I work for Goodman Games. Ah, okay. And he is coming to us all the way from the convention floor, so very, very far away. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the other side of the wall from you. I can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then we've got Torin Atkinson, whose uh, art has appeared in D&D, Call of Cthulhu, Spaceship Zero, Ruin Nation, and numerous others, and his talents have spanned actually multiple mediums. Um, it's nice to put a face to the name, finally. Yeah, same. <laughs> same yeah, with you. and uh, he's uh, been from page to screen, and he's even into 3D models for miniature gaming, and He's joining us from BC's Lower Mainland today. Beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Yes. <laughs> and of course, we have Hamad, whose latest art venture that we all know is actually on the t-shirts that we're seeing and the posters um, for CamCon, for the promotional images. He's an up-and-coming freelance illustrator and uh, has done numerous RPGs. I've seen his work in uh, many different books, and I am always amazed by his art style because of the amount of detail he puts in. If you're not sure about this, look at the CamCon logo. Trust me, I've seen the raw image and how massive that file was. <laughs> and of course, we have... Well, perhaps uh, Hamad could share screen and show us some of that. Uh, like yes. That. Yes, I, uh, I will if stop I my that. video. And uh, you kind of put me on the spot there. If I can have a moment just to open up. <laughs> no, my, that's all right. uh, he's, he's still doing introductions. So it's, yes, it's, right. Yeah. I'll, I'll sort that. In a yeah. Okay. And um, yeah. And here I'll show you guys the CamCon logo that Hamad has done. That's cool. Night of the Living CamCon. Like I said, <laughs> we're coming back from. from Where do you get a 22 sided there. dice? <laughs> yeah. Artistic liberty. Artistic liberty. It is the wonk is strong. Yeah, and of course, uh, we have Todd Lockwood joining us from, I believe, Washington State. Yep, Bonnie yeah. Lake. Yeah, and of course, Todd is a legend among D and D artists. <laughs> I mean, his art got me into the R. A. Salvatore novels. He's been in sci-fi. Um, He's done art for magic cards, um, and he's actually got uh, an upcoming collection tome called Found Worlds, The Art of Todd Lockwood. We are fulfilling as we speak. We've been mailing books all week long. We ran out of bubble wrap, or uh, we'd probably be done. I'm <laughs> back to work Monday. It's actually not too late to buy in if you want to copy I will definitely be picking one up. Because... I'm going to close the, the pre-order store shortly, probably this weekend, and open my website up again. So ah, nice. scoot in quick if you want to get the best price. Nice. And it is, it is an amazing collection, I'm sure, uh, because I've seen so much of your art. And the problem would be trying to figure out what to leave out. <laughs> It was a problem. It's 352 pages. I think and, you're uh, muted, Todd. How did I get muted? No, I hear him. Um, I should not be muted. Yeah, I hear you okay. No, I hear I hear you fine as well. Yep. Um, Let's see. Oh, that's strange. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, I hear okay. you. Uh, yeah, I can hear you guys. But you don't hear me? Yeah, I think the it. rest of us hear you, just not... Uh... Huh. Well, if the moderator can't hear everybody... There we go. There we go. I, can, I can hear you guys fine. I can hear you guys fine. Yeah, I think it was on my end. <laughs> okay. 
Um, the IT guy always gets the tech problems. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one thing I, I want to thank you all for taking time to, to join us uh, digitally and in person for William. Um, because I know it takes a lot of time and patience to to get into the art industry. Uh, I know Hamad uh, is a newcomer to the industry. Uh, what was it you were doing before your art again, Hamad? I remember you telling me. Um, before I was working on art, I was, um, well, no, I, I was just a boring banker back then, uh, Jeff. <laughs> No, what what do you call it? Um, I do. I kind of do artistically. I do two, or let's say creatively. I do two things at the moment, right? So, um, illustration when and as I have time, and um, mainly I write lore for an indie MMORPG called Monsters and Memories. Uh, what do you call it? Which is like which harkens back to the days. It's like it's one of those games that kind of kicks back to the days of EverQuest, and yeah. kind of. Uh, is being developed by people who actually worked on EverQuest back in the day. And um, they kind of yearn for that style of minimal coddling, minimal hand-holding style of old school MMOs. And they kind of blend a lot of ideas from old school tabletop role-playing games into this game as well. And it's all getting kind of created on the, you know, on the fly. We have a very, very nice team. We're about, you know, um, 14 people now. And uh, yeah, yeah, we, we kind of share everything that we're working on, you know, on, on our YouTube and uh, on A Loving Robot, which is Sean, our our um, chief, basically. He has a, you know, a, a Twitch stream, basically, that, that he just shares all the progress and talks about the game. And he brings other people that have worked on other computer games on to talk sometimes and stuff like that. It's kind of, kind of cool. But yeah, that's what I've been working on for the last couple of years. And then I fit art in, in the middle there when and as I can. And uh, otherwise, before that, yeah, I, I was just kind of trying to figure stuff out, really, you know, uh, corporate junkie that kind of packed all that in trying to discover new pursuits. So I landed back into art and um, things started working out, I guess, you know, in a way, or at least they're starting to, I should say, speak a little bit more humbly. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, uh, like I said, I, I've seen so much of your your artwork online. Um over the years, uh, since our last, since our last panel, and uh, it's it always amazes me, um, because quite frankly, I'm lucky if I can do a stick figure. <laughs> so, it's 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 interesting to to see the process. I follow a lot of artists because growing up with D and D and a lot of comic books, because my family didn't have cable as a kid. So we would, uh, I would have to use my imagination a lot. So a lot of the cover art inspired my kind of adventures as to, oh, this is what this planet or this, what this part of the world looks like. Um, so it's, it's always very, very interesting. And uh, one of the things uh, I wanted to talk about, of course, is the building of a portfolio. Um, because I know that can be a daunting task for any artist. Um, so well, it, ha it, it takes time. It happens over time. Um, I've heard it said that uh, you have to write a million words before you're an author, and you have to work with your medium for 10 years before you're an artist. Um, there's so much to figure out. You know, you're, you're internalizing things like your understanding of anatomy and perspective and light and shadow and narrative and um, so many things. So, I mean, I did advertising for 14 years before I found my way into sci-fi and fantasy genre. It takes time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and the the real question is like if you're going to be submitting to like say wizards of the coast who now own D, &D would you recommend sticking to like one type like the epic fantasy type or show them also a bit of sci-fi post-apocalyptic you should show them what they produce because that's what they're looking for they want artists who can work within their style 
Mm. That doesn't mean you can't step outside a little bit. And their style is pretty broad. If you think about uh, Rebecca Gray, uh, Rebecca Gay's work as compared mm. to Donato's work, as compared to Kevin, uh, uh, his last name just fell out of my head. Um, there's so many, uh, there's a broad range of art styles in magic, especially. Mm. But you want to show them what they're looking for, or they're going to pass on by. And you they'll know, usually when, have that listed. If, if it's a big company that has a has a website and takes submissions and everything, they'll have that listed on their website, more or less the guidelines for submitting portfolios. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I, I've seen a lot of artists that have gone into digital portfolios where they've basically got all their art online on their website to show off what they're capable of. Ideally, on a website of their own, as opposed to uh, art one station, of the aggregate art communities like DeviantArt or yeah. Um, I, I've also noticed a fair number of companies that are starting to go to those websites and are actively recruiting some talent. Hmm. Um, and you know, do you think this will be an ongoing thing or is it just kind of a flash in a pan trend? <laughs> Hard to say. I, I think it kind of feels like, you know, as the, as younger, as younger people, like the younger people will have a, a better handle on all the different social media and websites and everything. I think mm -hmm. as they start to become publishers themselves, they'll yeah. probably, that might actually be their starting point. Like, oh, I saw this cool artist on Reddit or whatever. I'm mm -hmm. going to, that might lead them to, the, mm. their uh, website or other social media and how to get in contact with them if it's not readily apparent on on whatever website or Twitter or anything, really. Yeah, the, the internet has changed the universe that I was looking for work in. Um, it, it, 25 years ago, I'd have told you to go to a convention because that's where the art directors would go to see new art, mm -hmm. to meet people, but uh, that, that's not so anymore. Yeah. Not yeah. necessarily. Yeah, and I mean, uh, there used to be, of course, uh, like Dragon Magazine featured a lot mm -hmm. of upcoming artists. Um, I know I used Where to... I got my start. Yeah, I know. My first published piece something. in the genre was a picture of Orcus, black and white drawing of Orcus that was uh, in 1979, I think. Oh, I didn't Dragon see that Magazine. one, but I, I've seen some of your other stuff in Dragon Magazine when I was a kid. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and I know that back then in the 80s, 90s, and even the 70s, you know, a lot of the up and coming artists were featured there. And usually within a couple years, you'd see them like doing art either for D&D books or for whatever uh, artists uh, com or art company tended to kind of snag them the moment they saw them. So, um, I feel like on the topic of conventions, though, like if you can go to a convention and you're an artist, you absolutely mm. should. Yeah, absolutely. Not only to meet, you know, to kind of uh, schmooze with with people who might be important to your career later on, but just to, to get a sense of what everyone else is doing and and what the whole vibe of the mm. of the scene in the community is, and and that can really help to push you to elevate your own artwork or go in different directions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, you want to go over there? And uh, of course, we've got William here at the convention, and uh, I was looking at some of his art prints earlier today, and uh, a couple of them might make it home with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm one of these guys where I'm always looking for good art, and William's got some amazing pieces. Well, thanks. I am um, just to add to where to for a new artist to put the work out. I, I got my first big gig with Goodman Games by just posting or just directly emailing them with a link to my website. But another one was just posting on enworld.org or uh, rpg.net. They all have freelancer sections there. Hmm. They're always looking for work, but you know, just got to avoid the ones that are looking for free assignments that are good for your portfolio type stuff. Right. Like, right. Yeah. Exposure. Yeah. The old yeah. paying exposure, and exposure will be good for you. Yeah. You, you yeah. can die of exposure. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't pay your rent with it. 
with that. Yeah. That's what one of my friends uh, that lives in Michigan uh, has always said. Unfortunately, my mortgage company does not take exposure as payment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I know a lot of artists that are transitioning have issues with this. Next one is rejection. Mm. Uh, any tips for developing kind of a thick skin or is it just get rejected skin, a lot and then you'll get used to it yeah yeah my skin got really thick during my advertising years <laughs> um but i've had nothing but good luck since uh joining the tsr staff mm. yeah, every once in a while you, you paint a stinker and but that's yeah that's when you need thick skin <laughs> yeah I think um, speaking as somebody is just kind of like dipping their toes into the industry, if you will. Like, I, obviously, I I'm, I'm I stand in the shadow of giants with my with my esteemed peers here, right? But like the idea is for me, um, coming from a bit of a corporate background and you know a lot of frontline roles in business development and sales, you have to develop a bit of a thick skin and deal with rejection. I think that kind of helps. You know, it, the the skill itself translates into the art uh, world as well, right? It's, um, on the one hand, you look at it in terms of, okay, you know, I have to be able to deal with people not liking my work or not wanting to work with me or not liking my rates, for example, or any kind of negative feedback and then just sort of not personalizing that. And I, I find what helps me is just to stop and listen and still be pleasant anyway and try and sort of understand <laughs> where, what, what perspective, the, hey, James, what perspective they're kind of coming from. But, Certainly not to um, kind of let your 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 emotion kind of take get your emotions get the best of you. Basically, I think that's kind of not the best way to go about these things because that that stays with you. That kind of I don't know if anybody else agrees with me on that one, but it really stays with you. And you start internalizing negative feedback and personalizing it. It um, it, it 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 weighs heavy on you. It weighs heavy on you. But on the other hand, you kind of if you can listen with a critical ear and with an objective mind, then mm -hmm. you can actually take that feedback on board and then incorporate it into your practice. And that um, I find is more conducive to being a more generally more pleasant person to work with. And you you can tend to avoid situations like that. I think, I think some forms of rejection are inevitable. They will happen. Like I don't think anyone can be rejection free, especially early in, in, in their career, whether it's art or, or anything else, you know, for that matter. <laughs> So I think it's an it's an important one to kind of learn, you know, just to not take things a little too personally and try to see what you can sort of pick up and, and you know, objectively from it and learn from it. And you think of all of the, you know, your favorite movies, your favorite comic books, your favorite artists, anyone, they've all been rejected a million times. You know, Stephen King was rejected a million times before he got his his bestsellers and everything. And it's just, it's just part of life. And, and yeah, you, you, you just can't take it personally because it could be for any reason. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the big questions um, uh, I've been thinking about was once you get into like that D and D, you know, art in RPGs, is it difficult to continue in that field? Um, you know, uh, like, in the IT field, we've always been told that you're only as good as your last job. And is that very much true in the art field, where it, once you get in, you've got to continue kind of being published uh, to remain relevant? Well, consistency, I think, is the most important thing. Um, that was stressed on me all the way back in art school. Um, 40 some years ago, uh, consistency matters more than anything. So, um, I, I mean, a stinker can lose you a client if you turn in something bad, especially on a, on a first time. Mm. But a lot of it is, is relationships as well, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I agree with that. Well, exactly. Communicate with your clients. Never leave them hanging especially if you think you're you're running late and, and you're not going to hit a marker on the way to the deadline, tell them up front, look, mm -hmm. I'm having trouble with this sketch. I need to reshoot my reference or whatever's going on so that they're not guessing what, what you're up to. Yeah. That's good. 
illustrator who meets deadlines than a great illustrator who never hands anything in. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. for us, mm -hmm. like indie publishing RPGs where they got the, such a fast turnaround. <laughs> yeah, very important. Yeah. Well, um, especially since the illustrator is often the uh, the last person whose work is required, but it, it, we tend to be at the bottom of the hill the shit rolls down, if you know what I mean. Um, their deadline is, their ultimate deadline is often our only deadline, and it may come late. They may not know everything that you need to know before you get your assignment, and, uh, and you only have as much time as they have left. So communication on both ends is kind of vital. So, you know, the client has to make sure that the illustrator understands, hey, you've got this deadline, we need to make it. But, you know, sometimes things happen. And as long as you can communicate, I guess, most clients tend to be a little more forgiving. A lot of the things that my supervisor, uh, I'm, I'm, I mainly work in the animation industry. And something that they keep hammering at home is like, don't guess, ask us, ask we probably confirm. have the answer. And mm -hmm. if we don't, we'll find out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good philosophy for any industry. I, I agree with that completely. Just never assume. <laughs> never Especially assume. Especially nuclear anything. physics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um... Uh, one trend we've been seeing a lot of, uh, especially uh, with RPGs, is uh, artists working with uh, the editors to create a really great flow throughout a, a game book, to make it more of a more of an adventure, and making sure that it's everything flows seamlessly, both artistically and content-wise. And uh, I guess my question here is. Um, does this happen often, uh, even back in the like the eighties and nineties? Uh, were you working heavily with? Do you work heavily with uh, editors to make sure that your art is following the flow of the book? One of the big pushes when we worked on third edition was to finally, for Dungeons and Dragons, develop a style guide that would be act as a center rail for freelancers. So that they would know what the dragons looked like, what the characteristics of dwarven armor versus human armor versus elven armor were like. Because prior to that, lots of great art, but there was Larry Elmore's art, there was Keith Parkinson's art, and then there was all the freelancers. And the range of looks was so wide that by the time third edition was gearing up, uh, the fantasy industry was so broad that it was hard to tell D and D from anything else. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the the main things that we pushed on while they were rewriting the rules was to Sam Wood and I and a handful of freelancers, Mark Tadine and a few others, designed all the monsters, designed the dragons, um, did anatomical studies of the different races and so on, so that freelancers would have a starting point and that it would be all over the board. And in Magic the Gathering, every new set begins with a concept push where they bring in a bunch of artists to design the look of the game for that set. Hmm. So it is really important. When it comes to Magic the Gathering and card games, generally speaking, <laughs> less so these days, but you always know what your frame is going to be for uh, other books, like a lot of books I've I've done with, hopefully the art director and the editor have all their ducks in a row before they get to me, mm -hmm. um, because you're going to get like, we just need this picture. We need a picture of a really fat guy in a very thin, <laughs> tall <laughs> drawing. You know, that's something you hope you don't get. But uh, yeah, that's some that those are the challenges that you might get. You know, I've I've had uh, you know there there's the usual three quarter or full page, which are all very standard. You know, uh, eleven uh, by eight and a half kind of uh, stuff. But sometimes you you will get you know weirdly shaped uh, art, and sometimes they'll say you draw what you draw, and we'll you know we'll work around it, which is which is great. But you have to be flexible. You have to be willing to to think outside the box. And Will, uh, you know, you're a creative director. Do you work quite closely with 
artists on books to kind of make sure that the flow feels correct and well that's easy for me i mostly do all the illustration myself <laughs> but i have had involved um don't quite have the budget for that yeah i wish i did there's so many talented people even here in calums that i'd love to work with and, and a lot of work artists i work with with good at goodman games um just, just phenomenal all handcrafted all you know traditional mediums i just love that look uh, so i wish i had bigger budgets for it i definitely have the assignments for it but not the budget and hamad i know you've worked on a few projects recently been working with editors uh i think uh yeah, I mean, look, the thing is that I, I haven't worked for a very large publisher. I've worked mostly with people who are kind of, um, you know, that the, the, are developing passion projects. I think the biggest the biggest project I've worked on recently is Weird Frontiers um, and working alongside David Beatty, the creator of the game. Um, yeah. but the game obviously is DCC compatible. So, I, I mean, I know Goodman have their... That have kind of given the stamp of approval on that game as well, you know, and it's um, David's just a right treat to work with, to be honest with you, like hands down, he's probably my favorite client <laughs> if I to speak very, very candidly, um, you know, he is mm -hmm. just because he, and I'll tell you why, it's because he knows exactly what he wants in his books, but mm -hmm. he also does not want to step on the toes of the creative license of the artist he really says like look here's my blurb or here's here's the thing now interpret it do you you know you're the artist you you make it look the way you need to make it you know the way you feel it should be made to look and that kind of um <laughs> that kind of insight on one hand because he doesn't leave you hanging he's not one of those people who gives you something so broad that you get this paralysis right because you don't know what to do and that you know he tells you what he what he needs and then he says do it your way and put your stamp on it. And for me personally, from the way I like to work, that's wonderful. That's really, really good. It's when when you find kind of like the opposite though, that becomes a bit more challenging. It's, you know, there's two scenarios that are my like worst nightmare come to life. It's the artist who has no, or sorry, the, 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 the author or the publisher does not know what they want. They have this idea in their head and they simply do not know how to articulate it, neither in writing nor verbally. And you're going to have, have to do like edits upon edits upon edits on that work until, you know, you lose your hair, mm -hmm. basically. Right. And and the other is basically yeah. the one that that starts to micromanage the art, you know, that's saying stroke by stroke, you know, and stuff like that. And that's also a bit um, tumultuous. So, no, I find I find that the few authors I've worked with, Jonathan Kelly, uh, David Beatty, the, they're, they're wonderful. They're just really nice to work with because they're like. You know, we have an expression in Arabia, you know, let the baker bake the bread. Mm. You know, it's like, don't, don't don't try to dip your toes in someone else's pond. Let them do what they do best. You know, saying so if you if you want good art, then give it to an artist and trust the artist to do their job, you know, well, basically. Right. And, and that's kind of, you know, uh, what makes them pleasant to work with, because I find that their attitude kind of mirrors this approach. And it's a it's a very nice one to work with. But I have worked with a couple of uh, more let's say, um, challenging people to kind of <laughs> satisfy, I suppose, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, you get the work done. I love but, how yeah, you're being so <laughs> diplomatic there. <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to. The thing is, I, I don't, I don't, um, at the end of the day, I also give them the kind of the benefit of the doubt, right? It's the, it's their, it's their labor of love, right? It's their thing. And I don't blame them for really like wanting, you know, the best for their, for their baby, basically, right? Or wanting, you know, whatever they can, they can get for their baby. I don't know. It's uh, I would not want a bad mom. I really I understand what it's like to work on creative projects. I know it's difficult working with teams sometimes and having to depend on others to get. But that's the nature of it, right? That's the nature of things. It's how it works. But yeah, I find I find trying to be pleasant to you know pleasant in working with people, listening, not making assumptions. All these other things we were talking about. They're they're good for me as the artist to help me kind of be somebody who people want to work with but on the flip side when you get somebody who kind of knows what they want and trusts you with the work because they like your style they like your your you know what you could bring to the table then all that much more wonderful you know i think that that's that's the, the ideal scenario to have indeed and i i would add that uh you should trust yourself trust your own instincts 
I mean, we we are storytellers too, as illustrators. Right. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I entered TSR with a mindset that I wouldn't just sit down and take a bad cover brief if uh, if I thought it that this was absolutely the wrong direction for the product. I could go down the hall and talk to the, the authors and pitch a better idea. And they usually were willing to listen because. You know, I think visually, and they they do not mm. necessarily. That's so cool. trust your trust your instincts, and don't be afraid to um, wince at a bad cover suggestion and search for something better if you think that that that's what's needed. Yeah. Not necessarily cover. I mean, any illustration. It really worked out for you. I mean, for all of us, actually. I mean, I wasn't even into D and D when I saw your covers on the. Um, third edition books and I, I just I bought them the books without even being a player I was just, mm -hmm. I just back into the whole hobby and everything from that and it changed my career from doing like cookie packaging and all the other types of illustration ar architectural stuff um and I'm so glad I discovered that just at a bookstore one day I just saw it sitting on the shelf like oh people still play D&D &D? how cool is that so, <laughs> yeah. I was thrilled thank to you, thank so yeah what a great honor thank you I second that actually, Todd. You're a personal hero. If I, I I've been saying that to Jeff and James for a while. Actually, I'm sort of my mind's boggled that I'm on the same panel with you. So I'm a bit starstruck. I have to admit. I'm curious to hear who who Todd uh, looks up to or looked up to. Oh well, my! Well, I grew up when Frazetta's covers were coming on to to books, and uh, so he was one of my first big heroes. He's sort of my left brain art father and then Michael Leyland came along and he he I was he was probably my biggest influence and my favorite artist and he would be my right brain father you know the one Rosetta so full of energy and emotion and passion and uh, Michael Allen's work that is so thoughtful and intelligent and uh, completely appropriate to the, the material you can tell he read the books and thought about them and uh, when I ultimately met him, I found out that he was a wonderful human being, too. Uh, he became a role model for me in a lot of ways. Just a, just a good person on top of being a magnificent artist. Yes. And, of course, the gang of four at TSR, you know, Elmore, Parkinson, um, Caldwell, um, and the, that fourth guy whose name just fell out of my head. And then along came Brom and um a great many freelancers easily of course duh. Yeah. Um, yeah i remember uh the first time i saw one of uh jeff easley's uh works in one of the D, D books it was one of those pictures where it was like a, a group of adventurers looking at a horizon and i'm like it would immediately drew me in and made me wonder what was over that horizon and made me want to create that adventure. His painting of a guy facing off against a giant in a forest. I think it was one of the first oh, yeah. edition advanced D&D covers. I don't remember now if it was a monster manual or the player's handbook, yeah. which, but that it was seared into my brain. You know, we'd been playing with the earlier edition with kind of amateurish covers. Yeah. And suddenly the artwork was magnificent and my jaw dropped. Um, I started yeah. aspiring to work for them. I think at that moment it took me 14, 16 years to get there. But oh, well, I mean, uh, back when I started looking at that art, I started seeing it completely differently than any others. Like I was a young kid, I read comic books and graphic novels and that, but that was the first time I'd seen like oil painting quality. Uh, and suddenly it's like, oh, wow, D&D &D has art that I'd never even considered. Mm. And um, yeah, so uh, that pretty much covers also my other question about paying your dues in the industry, because I imagine, you know, sometimes you, you don't get the jobs that you want or the clients that you want, and you just kind of have to put your head down and so, you know, it's like when actors say it's 
it wasn't a movie I was making. It was a paycheck. Right. Right. Yeah. And uh, one of the questions uh, we had uh, was, do you guys have Jeff? any favorite? Yeah. Uh, Jeff, yeah. I'm terribly sorry to interrupt you. Uh, just before you segue into the next question, yeah. do you mind if I ask one that kind of follows up from the previous one? Absolutely. I'm very curious. To, to, to my esteemed peers, has, has anybody ever had to say no to jobs before? And under what circumstances did you feel that had to happen if it did? I'm sure Todd must get a lot of commission requests that he doesn't have time for. Well, that happens. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, I have to admit that I got so tired of painting covers in which a party of adventurers were facing off against a giant monster. So their backs are all too. Yes. Too <laughs> <laughs> that um, I started turning them down unless we could come up with something else. Um, yeah, because it's such a trope. Um, you, you, inevitably, somebody's got to be doing this, yeah, or you know, looking back over their shoulder, or turn so sideways so that you get anything other than the backs of all these cloaked figures. Um, it kind of reminds me of the trope in the old westerns where you know they just walk off into the sunset and all you see is the silhouette mm -hmm. uh, of the the cowboy uh so i imagine that's kind of a big thing with dnd &D now looking back now yeah you're right it is definitely a trope because i can remember numerous books with that cover art no oh, i painted a number of them <laughs> <laughs> And not just for D and D, you know, also in in publishing for book covers. Yeah. So you know, I guess there is always uh, a reason to say no, if it's just something you've done many, many times. <laughs> were there any um like subject matters that were off bounds to you? Something that you didn't felt that I would not want to do this or touch that kind of you know subject matter to you know to paint or to draw. I don't like things that are overtly sexist, although I don't mind sexy. Gotcha. You see the, the distinction? Um, I I don't like women in chains. I don't like women being abused. I don't like torture of any kind, necessarily. Um, I mean, it's a... It, yeah, I mean, there's there's boundaries. What can I live with being seen as okay with, you know? I remember when I was working for Monty Cook during the height of third edition, and one of their rules, Mal Havoc Press rules, was like, we don't want chain ma male b bikinis, you know, make it, make it, you know, semi, as semi-realistic as you could make right. it, uh, you know, these, the armor is armor and it's got to work and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah. oh, thank God. <laughs> that was a push of mine too. Yeah, yeah. chainmail bikinis, especially when their nipples are so firm that they show through the chain. <laughs> through the the metal, chain. right? It's like <laughs> and the other ironically, thing that I ironically the chainmail bikinis later moved into the video game industry. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I that I sometimes stay away from is like if the artwork is too personal for the client. Like if a, if a friend of mine wants me to draw their kid doing some certain thing, and yeah. and I know that they're not they're not going to be satisfied um, with the job that I do because they have their own ideas, then I might just like I, I might I might I might walk away from that kind yeah, of politely bow out, right? Yeah, yeah. I I eventually shut down character portraits for that very reason. Right, William. Well, I can't think of anything I've said no to. Uh, <laughs> well, in that case, I have a commission idea for you. <laughs> now we know who to contact. He Matt, he'll do anything. <laughs> I, I don't think anyone knows this around locally here, but I once had to do I tell people, yeah, I went, once worked for an escort agency. But then I quickly had follow up with, oh, I, I mean, I did the website for it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> 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 sometimes it's great to get that little bit of clarification yeah. in yes. uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. with, uh, three kids and diapers and a mortgage and you know you, all you can all do mortgage is come and do in the first of the month so right. we'll do it. those days yeah <laughs> no they know just because they're too, like, like too busy with 
So yeah, well, I tried to uh, venture into comic books while I was still in advertising, and quickly discovered that's not a career move for a guy with a mortgage and three hungry mouths to feed. <laughs> Yeah. Well, ironically, I know a lot of uh, comic book artists that are actually making a good living, but now they're mainly writing the comic books. <laughs> yeah, well, more power to them. Yeah. yeah. But getting your foot in the door, that's the hard, that's that's the hard, hard stage. Yeah, yeah uh, I've looked at trying to get into the writing aspect of comic books, and it's like, if you don't have a literary agent, they're not going to look at you. <laughs> so... Uh, now, one of the questions we had uh, was about mediums and hardware and stuff like that for when you guys are doing your art. Do you have any preferred hardware or mediums that you use? Well, I've been painting digitally for quite a while, but uh, I had to replace most of my computer system a year ago following a battle with identity thieves. Ooh. And... Uh, the Corel Painter was my favorite, and the, the version that I'm kind of struggling with now, they eliminated half of my favorite brushes that were standard to the, it just drives me crazy. It's it's like I've got a 22-year-old car that only has 130,000 miles on it that I enjoy driving, it runs well, it gets good mileage, but... What if one day I woke up and now all the roads are magnetic levitation and you can't use tires anymore? Yeah. That's how I feel about the way technology just keeps changing, 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 reinventing the wheel with every iteration. It drives me a little crazy because as an artist, you find your medium and you want to you want to come to know it and get a workflow. And um, it's hard to do if they keep changing the parameters on you. For sure. But oils still work the way they always did. Pencils still work the way they always did. I love graphite and I love oil paint. Mm -hmm. So I'll probably, you know, I won't be able to produce as quickly as I did when I was working digitally. Mm -hmm. But uh, I will produce, you know, the, the only things I've painted in oil in the last few years were a couple of private commissions and the cover for my own novel. So. Uh, an oil painting that I want to own or see or have as an oil painting is something that I'll I'll go back to oils with. Otherwise, I'll keep fighting with Corel until I figure it out again. Yeah, I don't like change, so I've been working with Photoshop forever. Yeah, um, yeah but uh, I've heard good things about Clip Studio. I I have too. I didn't like Photoshop as a medium twenty years ago. It was basically a rubber stamp or an airbrush. It's changed a lot, but uh, I I was using Painter and was very comfortable with it. It let me paint the way I paint. Right. You know, I could emulate my oils approach in Painter, and uh, you can't really see the difference between the two unless you look closely. Whereas Photoshop would be a whole other learning curve. For me. Right. Yeah. I'm I'm a bit weird. I like I like. Um... I like ink on paper, but what I do is I thumbnail on paper and then I rough digitally, but then mm. I do the line art, the tight line art traditionally, again, on paper yeah. and the final touches and, and tweaks basically digitally. So I'm yeah. a bit odd in that way that I keep jumping back and forth on, on, a, on a single piece, but that's kind of what I've been doing recently with the last few pieces I've worked on, last bunch of pieces I, I've been working on, so... But the analog it's, always has so much more like character and life to it. I find I, but I agree you can't. You. But once you put it in Photoshop, you can move things around. You can scale things up and down, and it's exactly. such a time you saver. Do those little, yeah, do, those do little most things. of the drawing digitally for that reason. You can scale things. If you were to look at some of the drawings that I was doing back at TSR, the drawings that I um, then scanned and mounted on back in the day, I would do the drawing on vellum in graphite and then take it to kinkos and use their big mm. uh, document copier to transfer that onto watercolor paper and mount that and paint on it and if a head was too big i'd xerox it and a little smaller and knife it into my drawing and if things needed to be rotated slice it out tape it back in so there was this jigsaw puzzle being fed into the document copier right now doing it all digitally i'd I like even if for an oil painting, I'll draw it on the computer and then print it out and paint on it. 
and it's nice to have an undo button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Control Z, my God. My best happy accidents. Happy happy accidents. Happy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think the undo button is probably the greatest invention for computers. <laughs> I'm not speaking just as someone who appreciates art, but I'm also speaking as someone who has screwed up more times with a document than I care to admit. <laughs> Well, and and, being able to save iterations is invaluable too. Yeah. Yeah. True. And I'm all traditional media these days. Ink and for most of my drawings are graphite and then uh, acrylic paintings on board. But I, I definitely appreciate the undo button from all my Photoshop work. I still do yeah. some of that. I've just recently bought that Clip Studio paint. One of my kids, she works in that constantly. Oh. He's have, got you, me. have you have done it? Have you worked it yourself? I played with it one evening. That's the only time I've had hot so right. far. I it's fun, I think, but I keep turning it on dead automatically. I just had a habit, I guess, and I just know where everything is. It's an yeah. old shot when I, yeah. you know, I scan my pencil drawing in, and then I use like the smudge, like I color all the layers and I erase some layers, and then I go in with the smudge tool finally to make it look sort of oil painty. But uh, I love that. But. I don't know. One thing about being at conventions like I'm here, the opportunity to sell the originals. So you yeah. I, I art for the client once and then I can sell it again. I usually keep it at the exact same price that I was you know, paid, hired to do that. And uh, yeah, I usually yeah, sell quite a few at these conventions. Yeah, that's nice. And I also find it's like me personally, having done digital for so long, going back to analog is is surprisingly therapeutic mm -hmm. yes well you okay. can do it with camping or something around yeah the, which, you know campfire so i like that aspect of it but the one thing about digital you can you could sell prints and you can scale them up or down to fit different frame sizes pretty easy so i mean i sell quite a few prints too of old, older digital art i used to do so yeah i like that mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm still kind of uh, analog. Uh, I sketch every so often. Usually they end up doodles and some IT notes that I'm taking. Uh, <laughs> we do a lot of conferences and I, I just prefer writing the notes down rather than typing them. It's the old yeah, school like me. Right. About that, so yeah. I end up sketching something in the margins or something. So... And I haven't really had the time to mess around with Photoshop. <laughs> so, but I, I do know from Echo that she, uh, she said she'll change mediums quite often depending on her mood. If she gets tired of doing something digitally, she'll go to oil paints or just start sketching or something. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess it really does kind of depend on your mood uh, and also where you're, uh, if it's something for a client or if it's just something maybe you just want to draw and hang in the house. And sometimes you'd spend all that money on the Japanese markers and you just, <laughs> it's been like two years. I haven't picked these up. I got to get my value out of them. Guilty, guilty right here. <laughs> uh, and I believe Todd's looking for some paint markers that somebody sent him. Yeah, I found, I found some. There, there's a Japanese pen, Zebra McKee. Um, that is outstanding for signing prints or cards. Um, if anyone Absolutely. struggled with those pilot pens that you shake up for the gold or silver ink, and you'll oh, get yeah. like four good signatures out of it, and then it starts skipping and blobbing. And um, but I signed a thousand prints with one of those zebra markers, zebra pens. They should get you as a spokesperson. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually all found you, somebody in Japan who could buy them directly and then post them as a U.S. Uh, zip code from his uh, military base. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, you know, get you should get them. They should get you on as a spokesperson. All it cost them would send you a case of the markers every so often. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm set for life now, at least with the gold. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I believe that's about it for the panel time. Uh, I want to thank you again, 
everybody for attending and helping us kind of delve into kind of the art uh, behind the art, I guess, and kind of how to make that jump from just having it as a hobby into being more professional. Um, Because I know for a lot of artists that I know, that's a very daunting task. Practice, 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 and then put your stuff up for people to see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess where social media comes in. (laughs) Hey, Jeff, if you can get the links for uh, Todd's new book and his novel somehow attached to this page. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That would be great, yeah. Yeah, and we'll we'll be linking to uh, everyone's websites, including, of course, Outland Arts, which if you haven't played a post-apocalyptic mutant epoch, (laughs) you know, you don't know what you're missing. It's very fun. Will, you must be running some games this weekend. Um, mostly trying to roll up characters with people upside down from my booth, drawing their little mutants. Nice. But we got one of the other writers. He's he's running games right now. Perfect. Yeah. Wish I could be there. Yeah, it'd be great to get you up here again next year. Okay, and sounds good. Hopefully, in the near future, we can get Hamad over. We can I show, love that. We can show you snow. That. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. Yet to see it. You have to see it. Never seen oh, snow wow. in my life. I mean, my and uh, who knows? Maybe we can convince uh, Todd to come up sometime, and if nothing else, just hang out and play some D anD D with everybody. I'm sure that would blow a lot of our DMs' minds. <laughs> yeah. would, yeah, we'll steal. We'll steal his uh, Japanese markers and hold them hostage until. <laughs> <laughs> or we can just bribe him with other colors. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Throwing some info into the chat for you, real quick. Okay. 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 I will. I will mention that. Um, I will send a link to uh, Kickstarter, uh, and we will be promoting that. Uh, and your novel, Todd. You got a novel out? You were mentioned there. Briefly. Yeah, in 2016, uh, The Summer Dragon was published by Daw Books, and uh, I've just finished the sequel, and uh, I have that to illustrate coming up next. Once I get all these books out of my garage, um, <laughs> and, and well, we'll that's, share some. That, that's where my muse lives lately. Here, here's a direct link to the backer kit. Um, okay. People can still get a copy of uh, both books, actually. Um, you can pre-order Found Worlds, but by the end of this weekend, I'm taking this pre-order page down and opening the okay. website. Well, I'll be posting it on the CamCon uh, Facebook page tonight, complete with the link for uh, Found Worlds and all the other fun uh, art projects that everybody's working on. Torin is usually working on multiple projects, from what I gather. <laughs> I just uh-huh. discovered. I just started live streaming my my drawing sessions. Uh, oh, so cool. uh, very yeah. cool. I'm gonna start promoting my Twitch a little more. All right, we'll have What's to share the tag, Torin. What's that? What's your Twitch tag? Uh, I'm sure it's Torin Atkinson. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. we'll find out and we'll share the heck out of it. <laughs> Twitch TV slash Torin Atkinson. There you go. All right, perfect. And of course, uh, Hamad is the uh, art of Geed. Uh, which will have, uh, I believe, you're on Instagram, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media platform out there. Uh, not quite. Instagram and Facebook, full stop. So far, I've yet to learn how to market myself properly on social media, to be honest. <laughs> but we'll get there. We had some very nice uh, advice today on the panel. So I will be looking into that and sort of putting my house in order, <laughs> if you will. All right. And of course, we've got outlandarts.com, I believe it is. Yep, that's right. Uh, with uh, Will. And if you're at the convention, check him out. Check out uh, the booth. He's got plenty of cool prints, lots of books to buy, uh, old school art for like fifth edition. If you're looking for the old school stuff, uh, just for your own con- uh, conversions and collections, always fun. You should check him out. He used to be an escort. <laughs> uh, uh, 
All right. Well, thank you guys so much for showing up and spending some time with us at the Camelot RPG convention. And uh, who knows? Hopefully next year we'll have uh, at least Torin up here and hopefully Hamad will be a step closer to coming here and we'll get Todd up here to play some D&D &D and roll some dice with us. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. All right. All right. Thank you very much, nice Jeff. Thanks for a lot, Pam. And, and likewise, you. very nice to be with awesome. you here as well. Uh, you well. Uh, all right. Happy Thank Halloween. You. Happy Thank Halloween, you guys. We are We are so grateful for you sharing some of your wisdom with us and giving us ideas as to what to work on next. And, Good uh, luck with the rest of the convention. Oh, thanks. We are only on day one, so we've still got another day of RPGs and a couple panels. One is on D&D &D and education, talking about how it's being evolved into uh, helping uh, people with different needs and how to educate uh, okay. in the school system. That's wonderful. It's nice to see D&D &D going from pariah that will... Exactly. Like I was saying this morning, I had to explain to a guy that we are not like Ouija boards, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we are actually more like Lord of the Rings. Yeah, we're not <laughs> Satan worshippers. We're just we're just playing make believe with rules. That's all. Exactly. We're just we're just having fun. And so, it has almost as much math as Magic the Gathering. Almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> <laughs> almost, yes. For a lot of us, it's the reason our math skills were actually developed rather than in school. That's true. And That's I, true. I, I speak from personal experience. That I, got me through university, man. Yeah. <laughs> I can do advanced math in my head, but basic math, unless it's on dice, I have no idea. <laughs> all right. So we will talk to you all soon, and I will get that video up soon, and we'll link it up to uh, Todd Lockwood and everybody's sites. And, yeah, hopefully more and more people will find the uh, – uh, the new collection of Todd's artwork before he takes it down for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Oh, it'll it'll be up, but elsewhere, and the price will go up. Of course. Your so if you want to bargain, early bird price, yeah. Yeah, if you want to bargain, this is the weekend. This is it. Down me in. And of course, William's doing commissions, and Hamad, I think you know he's always open to doing some commissions. And Torin, well, I don't know if Torin has. I'm busy. To I'm busy. <laughs> yeah, Torin's <laughs> busy. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for uh, your time, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Right. Wow. Bye. See you later. Bye.